Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? You want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape, starring John Lund. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are groping your way slowly through the dark hold of a ship at sea, moving carefully, step by step, searching intently for something you dread to find because you know that this ship carries a cargo of death. Today, with John Lund in the role of Chris Warner, we escape to a harbor front in Venezuela and a grim voyage which started from there, as told by Martin Storm and his gripping tale, A Shipment of Mute Fate. I stopped on the wharf at La Guaira and looked up the gangplank toward the liner Shanke, standing there quietly at her moorings. The day was warm under a bright tropic sun, and the harbor beyond the ship lay drowsy and silent. But all at once, in the midst of those peaceful surroundings, a cold chill gripped me, and I shivered with sudden dread, dread of the thing I was doing and was about to do. But too much had happened to turn back now. I'd gone too far to stop. I set the box down on the edge of the wharf, placed it carefully so as to be in plain sight and within gunshot of the captain's bridge. I knew what I was going to do. But I couldn't forget that a certain pair of beady eyes were watching every move I made. Eyes that never blinked and never closed, just watched and waited. I turned and started up the gangplank. Uh, Oh! Oh, you, you startled me, sir. I, I didn't hear... What? Why, it's Mr. Warner. Well, hello, Mother Willis. How's the best-looking stewardess on the seven seas? Oh, well, I'm, I'm fine, Mr. Warner. Well, I, I guess I'd better run along now and get on with my chores. Wait a minute. That's a fine greeting after two months. Well, it's just that I'm so busy. Now, I don't believe a word of it. Sailing day's tomorrow. You're simply avoiding me, that's all. Oh, no, Mr. Warner, really, I'm not. And on the trip down from New York, you said I was your favorite passenger. Well, but I'm only Here. trying... To... what's that you're carrying in your apron? Oh, it's, it's nothing, just supplies. Supplies? Here, yeah, let's have a look. No, please. <laughs> Why, it's a cat. It's Clara, Mr. Warner. Mr. Bowman said I had to leave her ashore, and I just couldn't. Who's Mr. Bowman? The new chief steward. Well, Clara's been aboard with me for two years, and I just can't leave her here in a foreign country. Especially with her condition, so delicate and all. <laughs> well, I hope you get away with it. You you won't tell anyone. Oh, not a soul. As a matter of fact, if things don't work out right, we may both end up smuggling. to have had you aboard on the trip down two months ago, Christopher, and I'm happy to have you along with us on the run back to New York. Oh, thanks, Captain Wood. Uh, there is one thing, though. Mm-hmm. What's that? I'm uh, having a little trouble with the customs men here. Uh, I wondered uh, if you... I can't do it, Christopher. I cabled your father just this morning. I told him I would have done it for you if I possibly could. He sent a request from New York, you know. Yes, I thought he would. I uh, wired him from upriver last week. Well, I hated to refuse, but... That's absolutely out of the question. Captain Wood, I'm afraid I don't follow you. My responsibility to the passengers, son. We'll have women and children aboard. And on a liner, the safety of the passengers comes ahead of anything else. But with proper precautions... Something might happen. What? I don't know what, but something might. You've carried worse things. There isn't anything worse. Any skipper afloat will bear me out. No, Christopher. I simply can't take the chance. That's final. Final. It wasn't final if I could do anything about it. I hadn't come down here to spend two months in that stinking back country and then be stopped on the edge of the wharf. Two months of it. Heat, rain, insects, malaria. I'd gone clear in past the headwaters of the Orinoco. 
travel through country where every step along the jungle trail might be the last one. Oh, Sanchez! Si, senor, Warner. Better start looking for a place to camp. It'll be dark in a little while. Si, senor. Very soon we turn to river. Camp on rocks by water. This very bad country. This very bad country. You've been saying that for ten days now. Very bad country. Si, senor, Warner. This very bad country. Oh, skip it. For all the luck we've had so far, might as well be Central Park. Central Park? I don't understand. Oh, never mind. We don't... Here, what's the matter? Quiet there, quiet! Sanchez, what's wrong? They're in the path. See? Bushmaster! Bushmaster. The deadliest snake in the world. Bushmaster. Its Latin name was Lachesis Muta. Mute fate. It lay there in the center of the path. A ten-foot length of silent death, coiled loosely in an undulant loop, ready to strike violently at the least movement. Here was the one snake that would go after any animal that walked, or any man. It lay there and watched us, not moving, not afraid, ready for anything. The splotch of its colors stood out like some horrible, gaudy floor mat, lying there on the brown background of the jungle, waiting for someone to step on it. Here was what I'd come 2,000 miles for, a Bushmaster. It was three days later when Sanchez brought me the snake in a rubber bag. He was shaking so hard, I thought for a moment the thing had struck him. One thing you make sure, Senor Warner, no turn him loose in Venezuela, because he know I the one who catch him, and he know where I live. All right, Sanchez. I'll keep an eye on him. He know you pay me to catch him. All the time he watch and wait. You no forget that, Senor Warner. Because he no forget. Not ever. Well, after going through all that trouble and danger, I wasn't going to let a pig-headed ship's captain stop me at the last minute. At least not as long as the cables were still in operation between LaGuaira and New York. Morning, Captain Wood. Boy at the hotel said you wanted to see me. That's right, Christopher. Do. Uh, sit down. Thank sit. you. Seems you weren't willing to let matters stand the way we left them yesterday. Sorry to go over your head, Captain Wood, but I had to. The museum sent me all the way down here for that snake, and I'm not going to be stopped by red tape. Why, this will be the only live Bushmaster ever brought to the United States. If I had my way, Christopher. But orders are orders. I got a cable from the head office this morning. All right, now, suppose we talk about precautions. Well, I'll handle it any way you say. It's got to have a stronger box. That crate's too flimsy. Oh, it's stronger than it looks. That wire screen on top would hold a wildcat. Mm. But anyway, I bought a heavy sea chest this morning. We'll put the crate inside it. it sounds all right. We've got a lock on it. Heavy padlock. Mm. It's fixed so the lid can be propped open a crack without unlocking it. Snake's got to have air. All right. But in dirty weather, that lid stays shut. I'm taking no chances. Fair enough. We'll keep the blasted thing in my inside cabin, where I sleep. I can't have it in the baggage room. And nobody on board's to know about it. Whatever you say, Captain. We won't have any trouble. After all, it's only a snake. It doesn't have any magical powers. I saw a Bushmaster in the zoo at Caracas once. Had it in a glass cage with double walls. Never move. Just lie there and look at you as long as you were in sight. Gave a man the creeps. I didn't know they had a Bushmaster at the Caracas Zoo. They don't now. Found the glass broke one morning, and the snake gone. Night watchman was dead. They never found out what happened. Well, the watchman must have broken the glass by accident in some way. The way they figured it, the glass was broke from the inside. We uh, sail in four hours. Into the Caribbean, with perfect weather and a sea as smooth as an inland lake. The barometer dropped a little on the third day, but cleared up overnight. Left nothing worse than a heavy swell. But in spite of the calm seas and pleasant weather, I found myself feeling more and more often a, an ominous foreboding. I was developing an almost unnatural fear of that snake. I stayed clear of the passengers pretty much. Got the habit of dropping into Captain Wood's quarters several times a day. 
He kept the heavy box underneath his berth. I'd approach it quietly and shine my flashlight through the open crack. Never once could I catch that 12-foot devil asleep or even excited. He'd be lying there, half-coiled, his head raised a little, staring out of those beady black eyes, waiting. He'd still be like that when I'd turn away to leave. Maybe that's what bothered me, that horrible and constant watchful waiting. What in the name of heaven was he waiting for? Well, hello there, Mr. Warner. Oh, how are you, Mother Willis? My, but you and the captain spend an awful lot of time around this cabin. I'm beginning to think the two of you must have some guilty secret. Oh, no, no, nothing like that, Mother Willis. I don't know about Captain Wood, but I certainly don't have any guilty secret. Well, she's running quite a swell out there, Mr. Bowman. Yeah. A little heavy, all right, Mr. Warner. Guess the storm passed through to the west of us yesterday when the glass dropped. I think it missed us then, huh? Well, that's where the mate figures. Sure stirred up some water, though. This will put half the passengers in their bunks. <laughs> Makes it great for my department. Two-thirds of them will want a steward to hold their heads. They'll keep Mother Willis so busy that you... Wait. What? Look at the size of that wave. Great, you hose of it. We're going to take it on the port bow. You better hang on. <laughs> a freak if there ever was one. On another wave that size in sight. Yeah, you see them like that sometimes, even on a calm sea. Uh, I better get below, Mr. Warner. That water probably did some damage on the officer's deck. Yeah, I suppose. What did you say? The wheel companionway was open on the port side. The bridge cabins must have taken a pretty bad smashing. They're right below the... Something wrong, Mr. Warner? Oh, no. No, nothing at all, Mr. Bowman. At least, I hope not. <laughs> I didn't stop to find Captain Wood. Of course, I knew it was only one chance in a thousand, but the chances against that freak wave were one in a thousand, too. I stumbled down the companionway and along the passage to the captain's cabin. Oh, come on in, Mr. Warner. Oh, Mother Willis. My, isn't this cabin a mess? I'm trying to get some of these things out to dry. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to check... Where's that box that was under the captain's bunk? Oh, that? Oh, I just threw it out in the deck. What? With the desk over there slid into it. It was all smashed. But the small box inside of it, what happened to that? Oh, they were both splintered, Mr. Warner. Broke wide open. Oh, no. Why, Mr. Warner, you're white as a sheet. Mother Willis, will you go find Captain Wood? Yes, sir. Tell him to tell him to come down here immediately. Well, well of course, Mr. Warner. I'll go tell him right away. I can finish up here. Let's... I pulled open the top drawer of the bureau beside me and took out the captain's flashlight and the loaded pistol. Mother Willis had left a mop standing by the door. I put my foot on the head of it and snapped off the handle. Every move I made turned into slow motion. I could hear my own heart beating. Slowly, I started to search the cabin. Sodden heaps of clothing were scattered around on the wet black floor. I punched at them one at a time, holding the gun cocked, the flashlight pointing along the stick. Nothing. I worked around the room, throwing the light into the dark corners, back of the desk, under the bunk. Wherever I turned, I could feel those cold, unblinking eyes at my back, watching and waiting. Still nothing. Using the stick, I pushed open the closet door, threw the light inside. Carefully, I poked at the boxes and junk on the floor. The snake was not in the closet. Inch by inch, I covered the entire cabin. And only then, the horrible realization began to dawn on me. Captain Wood. Father Willis just told me. Well, Christopher. So, it's happened. That's right. It's happened. I see you found the gun. That's good. We'd better start by searching the cabin here. Captain Wood. I just finished searching it. Oh, Women, kids, that thing loose on board, a thousand places for it to hide. Heaven help us, Christopher. It's no 
sure you're starting to blame anybody now, gentlemen. I didn't call you in here to pass judgment. The thing's done, and that's that. Yeah, you're right what there, What we have Captain. got to do is to make up our minds how we're going to handle it. Well, it'd be easy if we didn't have to tell the passengers and crew. I've seen panics aboard liners before. I agree with you, Mr. Bowman, but I don't quite see how we can avoid it. Uh, they've got a right to know. As long as that snake's loose, everybody on board's on the same danger. And they all ought to know about it. Captain Wood, that thing is 12 feet long. It can't simply crawl into a crack. Why don't we make a quick search of the whole ship before we spread any alarm? I thought of that, Christopher. Well, as far as I can see, the only place it couldn't be is in the boilers or on top of the galley stove. It might have crawled overboard. No, no, no. We can't count on that. We've got to assume it's on the ship somewhere. Yeah, that could be anywhere. In a coil of rope or in a pile of clothes or under a baby's crib. Or even You've in already the... said it. That Bushmaster could be anywhere. We've got to do something, and we've got to do it fast. All right. I think the best idea is to follow Mr. Warner's suggestion. Make a quick search first. You agree to that? Yes, then, if we don't find it, we'll have to warn the passengers. We've got to find it. Alone in the dim baggage room, I went through the same movements as I had earlier in the captain's cabin. Gun in one hand, flashlight in the other, poking into every dark corner behind every trunk and box. Since the baggage room was empty, I could keep the gun cocked and ready. The rest of those poor devils were having to do the same thing barehanded. All over the ship, the search went on. Here now, Stuart. What on earth are you doing, rummaging through my cabin? I'm just checking up, ma'am. Well, I'm quite sure there's nothing in here that has to be checked. I'm sorry, ma'am. It's captain's orders. It'll only take a few minutes. Well, I've never heard of such a thing. A passenger simply doesn't have any privacy at all. I've traveled on a lot of different lines, but I've certainly never heard of it. <laughs> Sorry, sir. I wonder if you'd mind moving over to the other rail. I'd like to look through these lockers. Sure, go ahead. What's the matter? You lost something? No, no, nothing like that. No, just looking oh. things over. Well, there's nothing in there but life preservers. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You must be getting ready to sink the boat, huh? <laughs> you got to collect the insurance on it, is that it? <laughs> you got to send us all to the bottom, I know. <laughs> Not one of us could find that deadly shape, coiled in some dark corner or outstretched along a window seat. Not one of us caught a glimpse of that horrid head with its beady, black, watchful eyes. The thing lay waiting out there somewhere along the decks, shaded in the gathering dusk. But where, we didn't know. It was nearly dark when we met together again in the chart room. Well, gentlemen, there's no other way around it. We've risked all the time we can. We've got to warn the passengers. How we do it, Captain? Call them all together in the lounge? Oh, indeed. If we did anything like that, we'd be asking for a panic. Uh, we'll get one whether we ask for it or not. Pick a few men and go through the cabin decks. Tell them individually, inside their cabins. Watch for any that act like they might cause trouble, and we keep an eye on them. Handle the crew the same way. As soon as you're finished, arm all the deck officers and start searching again. Our only chance of preventing a riot is to find that damnable snake. The slow nightmare that followed grew worse by the hour. None of us slept. All the ship's officers not on duty kept on with that endless search. Passengers locked themselves in their cabins or huddled together in the lounges knowing all the time that no spot on board could be called safe. Fear was a heavy fog in the lungs of all of us, and every light on the vessel burned throughout the night. Morning came and brought no relief. Terror and tension mounted by the hour. There now, <laughs> Mrs. Crane. Stop getting yourself all worked up and go back to your cabin. The horrid things probably crawled overboard anyway. You're just saying that. You're paid to say it. You don't know. Nobody knows. No, no. Everything's going to be all right. If only we could do something. If all of us could only get off this ship, they could fumigate it. Yes, that's what we've got to do. We've got to get off the ship. No, wait. <laughs> Mr. Bowman, she's going to jump. Grab her. No, no, no. Nice work, Mr. Bowman. Get her down to her cabin. And whatever you do, don't turn her loose. <laughs> You never know when it might strike you. Right. You can't put on a coat or move a chair without risking your life, and something's got to be done. It might be right here in this lounge. All right, mister. All right, you better quiet down and take it easy. Take it easy, eh? You're a great officer. Why don't you do something about it? That thing might be crawling around here right under our feet somewhere. I said shut up. What are you trying to do, start a panic? I got a right to talk. I don't want to die, and no one's going to tell me what... <laughs> The 
second night passed and morning came around again. A gray and rainy day that dragged past and then night came down. Third night of the terror. Again, every light burned and the whole ship seized in the throes of incipient panic. Faced by a horror they'd never met on the sea before, crew and officers alike were on the verge of revolt. Passengers sat huddled in a trance-like stupor, ready to scream at the slightest unknown sound. At seven bells, I made my way forward to the chart room. Found Captain Wood bent over a desk. Oh, hello, Christopher. Come on in. Sit down. It's got to be somewhere, Captain Wood. It's got to be. I don't know. You can search this ship for six months and never touch all the places aboard. If we can only hold out for two more days, we'll be in. What's your home office say? Here's the latest wireless from him. Keep quiet and keep coming. What else can we do? A cigarette, Chris? Oh, thanks. How is it on the decks? Pretty bad. Anything could happen. Yeah. That's right. I took the guns away from the men. One pistol shot, we'd have a riot on our hands. The whole thing's my fault, Captain Wood. That's what I can't oh, forget. Now take it easy, lad. There was only some way I could pay for it myself, alone. No, no. I know how you feel, but it's no more your fault than mine or the man who asked you to bring that snake back alive. Nobody planned this. You'd better try to get a little sleep, I think. Sleep? Mr. Bowman made some coffee down in the steward's galley a while ago. Better go on down and get yourself a cup and then rest for a couple of hours. Rest? I can't rest. Christopher, it's not going to help anything if you'll stumble through a hatch half asleep and break your neck, now is it? Hmm? Go on, get some coffee. Okay. One way or another, we've got to hold out for two more days. The light was on in the steward's galley, and the coffee pot was standing on the stove. It was still warm, so I didn't bother to heat it. I poured out a cup, carried it over, and set it on the porcelain tabletop in the center of the room. I started to light a cigarette. The door of the pan cupboard beneath the sink was standing slightly ajar, and I happened to glance toward it. I dropped the cigarette and moved slowly backward. I found the Bushmaster. As I moved... The snake slid out of the cupboard in a single sinuous glide and drew back into a loose coil on the galley floor, never taking his eyes off me. I moved slowly back, waiting any moment for that deadly, slithering strike. How had he known it was me? He'd stayed quiet when Bowman was here. How had he picked the first time in five days that I was without a gun? My hands touched the cold bulkhead behind me, and I stopped. Only then I realized in terror what I'd done... The call button and door were on the far side of the room. I backed into a dead end. I stared at the snake in fascination, expecting any moment the ripping slash of those poisoned fangs. The horrible coils tightened a little, then were still again. Ten million years of evolution to produce this moment. Homo sapiens versus Lucasus muta. Man against mute fate. And all the odds were on fate. I knew then that I was going to die. I could feel the sweat run down between the painted wall and the palms of my hands pressing against it. My skin crawled and twitched. The pit of my stomach was cold as ice. There was no sound but the rush of blood in my ears. The snake shifted again, drawing into a tighter coil. Always tighter. Why didn't the devil get it over with? And... For just an instant, his head veered away. Something moved over by the stove. I didn't dare turn to look at it. Slowly, it moved out into my line of vision. It... it was a cat. That scrawny cat, Clara, that Mother Willis had sneaked aboard in LaGuaira. Its back was arched. Every hair stood on end. It moved stiff-legged now, walking in a half-circle around the snake... The Bushmaster moved slowly, kept watching the cat. He tightened. He was going to strike at any second. He struck and missed. The cat was barely out of reach. Now she was walking back and forth again. She was asking to die. Missed again by a fraction of an inch. He was striking now without even going to a full coil. Missed again and again. Always missing by the barest margin. Each time the cat danced barely out of reach. Each time she countered with one precise spat of a dainty paw, bracing her skinny frame on three stiff legs. And then suddenly, 
I realized what she was doing. The Bushmaster was tiring, and one strike was just an instant slow. But in that split second, sharp claws raked across the evil head and ripped out both its eyes. The cat had deliberately blinded the snake. He didn't bother to coil now, but slid after her in a fury, striking wildly, always missing. And every strike was a little slower than the last one, until finally... As the snake's neck stretched out at the end of a strike, the cat made one leap and sank her razor-sharp teeth just back of the ugly head, sank them until they crunched bone. With tooth and claw, she clung as the monstrous snake flailed and lashed on the floor, striving to get those hideous coils around her, trying to break her hold to shake off the slow and certain paralyzing death that gradually crept over him and at last stilled his struggles forever. I took a deep breath. The first in minutes, the cat lay on her side on the floor, panting, resting from the fight just over she had a right to rest. That mangy, brave, beautiful alley cat had just saved my life. And maybe others as well. But then, as I turned toward the stove, I suddenly became very humble. And I knew all at once what a small thing a human being really is. I and others aboard were still alive only by the merest accident. There were three reasons why that cat had fought and killed the world's deadliest snake. And those three reasons came tottering out from under the stove on shaky little legs. Three kittens, with their eyes bright with wonder, their tails stiff as pokers. Up on the decks, hundreds of passengers were waiting for the news that the days and nights of terror were ended. Well, they could wait a little longer. I pulled open the doors of the cabinet and found a can of milk. Then I dropped down on my knees on the floor of the galley. Escape, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, has brought you John Lund in a shipment of Mute Fate by Martin Storm, specially adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield. Featured in the cast were Barry Kroger as Captain Wood and Lois Corbett as Mother Willis, with David Ellis, Don Diamond, and Vivi Janis. Special sound effects by Earl Keane and Gus Bays. The musical score was conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week, you are trapped in a remote valley in the Andes, walled in by sheer rock precipices, and surrounding you, closing in on you, is a band of blind men who want your eyes. <laughs> Next week, escape with H.G. Wells' great story, The Country of the Blind, when our star will be that fine actor, Edmund O'Brien. Good night, then, until this same time next week, when once again CBS offers you Escape. John Lund may soon be seen starring the Paramount picture, Bride of Vengeance. This is Roy Rowan speaking. It's time now for the most wonderful hour of laughter on the air. The mad and merry 60 Minutes with the Jack Benny Show and with Amos and Andy. They will be heard over most of these same CBS stations. And Jack Benny will come to you over them all. You'll never miss them by staying tuned to the station where they say, This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week. The Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>